Zazen Zenji's chant in praise of Zazen. From the beginning all beings are Buddha. Like water and ice, without water nor ice, outside us no Buddhas. How near the truth and how far we seek. Like one and water crying, I thirst. Like the son of a rich man wandering poor on this earth, we endlessly circle the six worlds. With the cause of our sorrows, ego delusion. From dark path to dark path, we've wandered in darkness. How can we be free from the wheel of samsara? The gateway to freedom is Zazen Samadhi. Beyond exaltation, beyond all our praise is the pure Mahayana. Observing the precepts, repentance and giving, the countless good deeds and the way of right living all come from Zazen. Thus one true Samadhi extinguishes evils. It purifies karma, dissolving obstructions. Then where are the dark paths to lead us astray? The pure lotus land is not far away. Hearing this truth, heart humble and grateful, to praise and embrace it, to practice its wisdom, brings unending blessings, brings mountains of merit. And if we turn inward and prove our true nature, that true self is no self, our own self is no self, we go beyond ego and past clever words. Then the gate to the oneness of cause and effect is thrown open. Not two and not three, straight ahead runs the way. Our form now being no form, and going and returning we never leave home. Our thought now being no thought, our dancings and songs are the voice of the Dharma. How vast is the heaven of boundless Samadhi. How bright and transparent the moonlight of wisdom. What is there outside us? What is there we lack? Nirvana is openly shown to our eyes. This earth where we stand is the pure lotus land, and this very body, the body of Buddha. This is the first day of this January 1981 uh, Toronto Sashin. And we will read from the life and letters of Basui from the Three Pillars of Zen. And so many people who have spoken to me about the reading of these letters and Basui's life history last year, that we'll do some more of it. It's very important when one hears what the Taisho is going to be all about, not to get involved in this thinking, oh, I know, I don't know this, I know this biography, I know those letters, I've read them umpteen times, I've heard them over and over. When you say this and think this, then you live in this mind of memory, which is the mind of prison. Can one listen to these words written, spoken, heard? So I never heard them before. With a mind that does not make reference to memories, to comparisons, to what it knows. Usually when one attends a, attends a lecture, one wants to take as much as what the lecturer can give one and add it to what one already has. So one leaves the lecture hall a little bit heavier, a little bit more burdened. Although some facts that one can lead in a lecture can also take away a whole bunch of wrong facts or wrong ideas that one has had. In listening to Teisho, first of all, take a comfortable position. Don't worry when you have to change it, when it gets uncomfortable, change it. Change it quietly. It's a tremendous thing to shift the legs around the robes around quietly. When you do this attentively, your own attention and intensity of Zazen will be deepened by it, and so will that of your neighbor. Whereas if you do it thoughtlessly, then your mind is distracted, and so is the possibility for your neighbor's mind to become distracted by in inattentive rustling which is not so when there's attentive moving. Mm -hmm. 
listening to Taisho is one third of the sheen. It's often been compared the sashin to a three-legged stool, one leg being zazen, one leg being teisho, one leg being doksa. And you can just visualize what happens to a stool if one leg isn't there. And teisho means just that, listening. It doesn't mean holding doksa with a teacher at that time. Doing zazen as far as counting, inhalations and exhalations, experiencing the breath, no, drop that for the time being. As to questioning the koan, it just depends how you're questioning it. If it's just moo, 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 mechanically every once in a while that you think of it, drop it. It's no use to do it that way. However, if there's just moo listening, who listening? And there's no interference, and there's no division. <clears throat> Not grabbing facts to accumulate them, but can one see directly within oneself what these words are pointing to? It's the only reason the teacher is there for not to be imitated or followed but to see for oneself what he or she's talking about not intellectually but directly directly direct seeing it's given to every human being only we immediately translate it or interpret, compare, store it up, cling to it, mull over it. That's the end of the listening. Can one listening, can one listen with a seeing eye, seeing the truth of what is said, or the falsehood? Which means there's a tension there, every pore of the body, Every little hair standing in attention, like every little hair on a cat as it stalks and watches is attending. In such attention, there is no teacher, no student. Those are just ideas. We start with the editor's introduction. In the year 1327, toward the close of the Kamakura era, the strife-torn, anxiety-ridden period of Japanese history that produced so many notable religious figures, the Rinzai Zen master Basui Tokushu was born. Having had a vision that a child she was carrying would one day become a fiend who would slay both his parents, his mother abandoned him at birth in a field where family servants secretly rescued and reared him. It's such an interesting phenomenon that it's always in the strife-torn, anxiety-ridden periods that notable religious figures are produced or whatever way you want to put it. It seems we always need strife, anxiety, crisis, emergency to be shaken up, to question, to come to some urgency to understand what this is all about. Or is it possible to even be wakeful and attentive when there's no strife and anxiety? Or do we immediately go to sleep again when that is the case? The 
mother had a vision that the child would fiendishly slay both parents, so she left him someplace in the bushes. Trying to rescue herself from this monster that she had given birth to, that she thought she had given birth to. Because she had a vision that she was incapable of seeing the meaning of clearly. We do this so often. Interpret our dreams, our ideas, and then we act on that. We're not even sure that we've seen clearly or dreamt clearly for that matter. Most of the time we dream most confusedly. I always want to act on that. She wanted to survive. The, all kinds of groups these, and individuals these days I've seen on television, they call themselves survivalists. Have also these visions, and it's not difficult these days if you read the paper, see the news, to have all kinds of visions of a Holocaust, or conflagration. And then out of this vision, one gets this idea I'm going to rescue myself, I have to rescue myself, and I'm going to get provisions together for 40 days or end a gun because somebody else may come and want those provisions too. It's amazing to see that people together with these provisions, many of those store guns because they couldn't survive if somebody else got them. So what do you do? What is survival? Killing off all of one's enemies? And then what is one going to do? Isn't one then going to immediately create and bring about the same kind of world? Because nothing has been resolved inside. Hatred, fear, division, selfishness, it's all there, ready to survive. Bring about another world of the same kind. Or can one in the midst of all this mess find out whether division, selfishness, envy, Fear can wither away within oneself so that one will not contribute to this world of envy, misery, hatred. Isn't it worth trying? At seven, Basui's sensitive religious mind began to evince itself. At a memorial service for his late father, he suddenly asked the officiating priest, for whom are those offerings of rice and cakes and fruit? For your father, of course, replied the priest. Father has no shape or body now. How can he eat them? To this the priest answered, Though he has no visible body, his soul will receive these offerings. If there's such a thing as a soul, the child pressed on, I must have one in my body. What is it like? It's wonderful if children can be told these stories but not be snowed by them. It's all right to tell these stories if you must. If you're so conditioned that you just must pass on all these old stories. Thank God there are children who will still question. I 
wonder. I don't have small children. What children ask when they come on, on ceremonies too, they also ask for whom are those nice cupcakes there, those cookies. Who eats them? Do they ask that? I asked it once. Somebody told me the monks eat them. <laughs> Afterwards, when they're all, this, they're very tasty of incense. They really don't taste very much. <laughs> Please don't say that I said the monks eat them. I was told that. It's a, a terrific mind. It's really a scientific mind. You can say a religious mind. You can also say a scientific mind, as a small child has. If he has a soul in his body, I must have one. If I have one, what is it like? A very sane, clear, sober reasoning. And not then stopping there, but proceeding to try to find out. That's, that is religious or scientific investigation at its best. Have a good question and then let nothing stop you. Get to the bottom of it. Because in science you never get to the bottom of it. It's always something new. That you don't know enough about because you're working with your limited mind of knowing. To be sure, these are not unusual questions from a thoughtful, sensitive child of seven. For Basui, however, they were only the beginning of an intense, unremitting self-inquiry, which was to continue well into manhood, until, in fact, he had achieved full enlightenment. Even during his play with other children, he was never free of the uncertainties as to the existence of a soul. To carry this question around with you, not to bury it, a deep, gnawing sense of disease or dissatisfaction, not to bury it, not to squelch it in this or that entertainment or distraction or profession, but to let it guide one. Ask questions, not be snowed in. His preoccupation with the soul naturally led him to think about led him to think about hell. In an agony of fear he would exclaim, How awful to be consumed by the flames of hell, and tears would well up. Almost no religion. I don't know of that doesn't have these stories of hell. And there are many willing parents who use those to keep their kids in line. Bunke was another child. He was so self-willed and hard to deal with that the parents would, oh, he was a fair, a scared of death, so they would always bring up something of death to, to get the kids scared enough so he, he would obey. This whole system of obedience is based on fear. Fear of what might happen to me if I disobey, if I question, if I challenge. Is it possible to raise children without fear? Or to function as a society, as a group of human beings without fear? any fear or intimidation without reward or punishment just doing what needs to be done to the best of one's ability it's impossible cuz stories of stories of hell need not be invented. Hell is all over the place. 
in poverty-stricken homes, in famine-stricken areas, in wealthy homes. Hell, because we are not related to each other in love and affection and understanding. But through ideas of what I am, how you should treat me, how you should see me, how I want to be treated, and ideas of how you are because I know how you've been. Today you may not be at all how you've been. But I can't see that because I respond to what I see you've been yesterday. That's hell. Because in that there's no, no relationship, no communication. No togetherness. Only self-isolation with all that it brings in its wake. Fear. And all kind of activities to overcome that, to sublimate it or compensate for it. Is it possible to live without a single image about oneself. I'm this, I'm that. To see when this comes up how this is our strength, our, our false protection, our, our clothes. We are our clothes, we are our images. We're not what we are. What are we without all that? What are we? Don't we want to find out? Well, there's any way of existing, not really knowing what one is. In terms of any idea or image that has been plastered upon one by teachers, parents, or that one has picked out for oneself from stories one have re has read or people one has met. always keep us in bondage and in armor and they get hurt somebody doesn't pay respect to it and there's hurt and there's revenge I'm going to show you I'm going to hurt your image can there be freedom from this Find out, one must find out, one must question this. One questions it, and who, who am I? Who am I beyond all images, all ideas, all that anybody has ever told me about me? Which is not easy because we're unconscious of all of that even. It's so heavily habituated into us, but it's not impossible to break through that, at least for moments at a time. this crust, this armor. When he was ten, he relates, he was often awakened by brilliant flashes of light which filled his room, followed by an all-enveloping darkness. Anxiously he sought for some explanation of these weird occurrences, but the replies that were forthcoming scarce, scarcely allayed his fears. A lot of people have all kind of weird occurrences. And don't think because you read this and you haven't had them, there's something wrong with you. Or you should have them if you think yourself hard enough into that. You will have them. But what does it mean? See, Basui, all kind of people, probably priests, fathers, mothers, servants, they all gave them explanations. We're all so good at that. We pant to give an explanation when somebody asks us something. It's also a strong habit. Just to give an explanation makes us feel a little bit in the know for a moment. It's, it's a real habit to ask for explanation, to give it, and to receive it, and then to forget all about it. But nothing has been changed or laid. The fears are still there. And Basui would not be fooled 
would not be deceived. He listened to the explanation and he listened to the fear was still there. All right then, what is this fear? Let me face it, let me plummet, let me not run away from it. Let me moo or who or breathe or count right in the midst of it. Or else I'll drag it with me to the end of my life. Or it will drag me and rule me, make me do all kinds of weird and irresponsible things. Again and again he questioned himself, if after death the soul suffers the agonies of hell or enjoys the delights of paradise, what is the nature of the soul? But if there's no soul, what is it within me which this very moment is seeing and hearing? Again, there's strong conditioning to things in terms of to think in terms of something within one, the little man or the little woman, who hears and does and controls, sees, prods. We cannot conceive with our thinking mind of their just being hearing, seeing because we don't do it, because the mind of explanation, interpretation always sits right behind the eyeball or the eardrum. No sooner is there this perception of sound, there's already a, an explanation for it, a word for it, a memory of it, a like and a dislike of it, a wanting to grab it or wanting to get rid of it. What is it that is hearing and seeing? Who or mu? His biographer relates that Basui would often sit for hours stewing over this question in a state of such utter self-forgetfulness that he no longer knew that he had a body or a mind. I know of a person whom we met out on the West Coast. He's a computer scientist, has a very high paying job in one of these big computer companies that sends devices right now to, to Jupiter and beyond. His mother or grandmother happens to be a Cherokee Indian. You can still see the white cheekbone. He doesn't belong to any sect or school or teacher, but he says he often sits for hours on a rock, brooding, trying to think out who's thinking what this thinking is. If thinking can come to an end, and then what? He showed us the rock, it's in the Santa Cruz Mountains, it's a lovely area. A springtime with these oaks, dark stemmed and dark branched oaks just bursting out into leaves. And the leaves are ever so light green. You've never seen a shade of green like that here. Light green and pink. You think it's flowers, but it's leaves, new leaves, pink and green. These dark stems, 
almost like charcoal. On one such occasion, at what age we're not told, Basui suddenly directly realized that the substratum of all things is a viable emptiness. And remember the word is not the thing. And emptiness is not a thing, it's no thing. That there is in essence nothing which can be called a soul, a body, or a mind. <laughs> he saw this for himself. Didn't have to ask any more priests. He saw it for himself. This realization caused him to break into deep laughter. He lo no longer felt himself oppressed by his body and mind. When are we oppressed by our body and mind? Isn't it always when we're thinking about it? Thinking in a divisive way, me and this aching body of mine. Or is it this just oh, total oneness with that? No separation, no me. You don't have any energy left to say me. Don't waste it. It's just that. There's no oppression. Then it's just what is. And it'll be a passing thing. But if you wait for this thing to pass, then you're divided. She told me it would be passing, and it's not passing. Then you're oppressed. We always cause our own oppression. Not that there's no, no such thing as pain. There is. But without naming it, without knowing it, without calling up all this whole associative network, all the fears and previous knowledge about pain, what it does or could do or may do, or, and there's just one knows not what. And one probes into it with a questioning mind. Questioning mind is never divided. It is that thing, not knowing. In an effort to learn whether this constituted true awakening, Basui questioned a number of well-known monks, but none could give him a satisfying answer. At any rate, he told himself, I no longer have doubts about the truth of the Dharma. The Dharma being truth. He had seen something very, very clearly for himself. Nobody could take it away from him. Didn't have to believe in that. Just like you don't have to believe that the sun is shining. It's there. But his basic perplexity as to the one who sees and hears had not been dispelled. When he saw in a popular book one day, quote, Mind is host and body guest, unquote. Every one of his quiescent doubts was suddenly resurrected. I've seen that the foundation of the universe is voidness. Still, what is this something within me which can see and hear? That was a tremendous thing about Basui, not the insight he had, but that he would not deceive himself. fall back into a life of no doubt, no questioning, and a comparable ease and comfort, which is really a life of slowly ebbing away, deteriorating. He desperately asked himself anew. In spite of every effort, he could not rid himself of this, of this obsessive doubt. Nominally, Basui was a samurai, having been born into a samurai family. 
whether he actually pursued the duties of a samurai, his biographer does not avail, reveal. But it seems safe to conclude that Basui's continuous search for Zen masters would have given him little opportunity and presumably as little taste for the life of a samurai. It's of course, also a, an interesting thing that he was not bound by that particular conditioning. It was there. He had lived through it, probably had absorbed a lot of it, but it didn't bind him. It didn't tie him. He was able to walk away from it. So often people say, I'm doing this because of, in a previous lifetime I must have done that. So what? Does that mean that you have to do it in this lifetime? This doesn't follow. It doesn't follow. If you need to do something, then do it. And don't rationalize you did already previously. How do you know anyways? Well, some people say they know. Can one go beyond what one knows about previous lifetimes or future lifetimes? Is it possible? At all events, we do know that Basui has had his, had his head shaved at 29, symbolizing his initiation into the Buddhist monkhood. For the ceremonial rites of a monk or priest, however, he had little use, believing that a monk should live a simple life, dedicated to attaining the highest truth, so as to lead others to liberation. Not engaged in ceremony and luxurious living, not to mention political intrigue, to which the priesthood of his day was only too prone. And it need not be put into the past tense. Wherever human beings congregate together into institutions, organizations, very quickly some hierarchy builds up and becomes the opportunity to gain some status. Not everyone is roped in by that. Because it's a, it's a mistake. There are different functions. Our, our hands function differently from our, our head, or our legs, or knees, or back, eyes. They all function differently. But does it mean one has higher status than the other? Greater prestige? Although we, we do think of that in those terms too. The head has greater prestige than the butt. But it's our thought attributing this to it. I read so many things about people joining monasteries, training for a few years only to take it over or ascend in the hierarchy. which means one's basic fundamental feelings of inadequacy, insufficiency, and loneliness have never been faced, never been resolved. So whether one ascends the political ladder or the clerical ladder, what difference does it make? It's the same thing. One needs to be somebody, have an image, before others and before oneself, to which one clings for dear life, Basi, Basui knew what he needed to do and knew what was dangerous. He stayed away from it. He saw it for himself. I don't think anybody told him. On his numerous pilgrimages, he stubbornly refused to remain even overnight in a temple, but insisted on staying in some isolated hut high up on a hill or a mountain, where he would sit hour after hour doing zazen away from the distractions of the temple. 
So many people living in the distractions of the city think, oh, if I could only get myself into a quiet temple. I know one person, a close friend, who went through with this idea and she joined a temple someplace in, in the Far East. And it was the noisiest place she'd ever been in, right next to an American army base. <laughs> And that wasn't the only noise there. But she had to do it, she had to find out. Nothing with trying to find out something for yourself. Not take the biographers, buses, or anybody's word. If you need to find out, find out for yourself. To stay awake, he would often climb a tree, perch among the branches, and deeply ponder his natural koan. Who is the master? Far into the night, oblivious to wind and rain. To stay awake, he would climb a tree. Because if you're not awake, you fall out of the tree. There's a little tree house there. But he just perched among the branches. Well, he did it his way. I don't know. Climbing a tree. In the morning, with virtually no sleep or food, he would go to the temple monastery for an encounter with a master. How to keep in mind or to see? It doesn't look as this was as though this was done out of any idea that one, in order to come to enlightenment or something or other, one mustn't eat, one mustn't sleep. This, this question was all consuming to him. So food and sleep didn't matter. There was tremendous energy there. Energy generated by the urgency to find out and nothing else. Can one find such urgency within oneself, such fire, and if it is just a glowing ember? It will come to glowing if one is very observant of how one lives, how one relates, how people live, how this whole world lives and dies. And what is the cause of all the sorrow in oneself and in others, in this whole world? That's why the Buddha left his home. He had to find out. Not just what the cause was to analyze it. Anal analysis doesn't bring relief. Find out if it can come to an end in one human being end, be freedom from it, then maybe it can come to an end in the world, not the other way around, trying to figure out blueprints of how to bring division to an end in the world by creating this or that new nationality or super nation. It never works, never has worked. Never has worked as long as human beings feel so weak, insecure, insufficient that they cling to identities <coughs> of being a this or that. It doesn't mean that the ego has been overcome, it has just been submerged in the greater entity. For whom one is going to willing to to fight, to kill other people, to die, and nothing is resolved. So strong was Basui's distaste for the ceremonialism of the temple that many years later, after he had become master of 
Kogakuji. He always insisted on calling it Kogakuan instead of the suffix instead. The suffix an meaning hermitage as opposed to the more grandiose ji meaning temple or monastery. In the course of his spiritual journey, Spasui eventually met the Zen master through whom his mind's eye was to be completely opened, Ko Zenji, great Roshi of his day. It says, through whom his mind. It doesn't say that the master opened his mind. There's no such thing. Awakening. Mind opening has no cause. It's there. When there are no shutters. And yet in ways we don't understand or know, there can be an opening of the mind at a word, at a sound, at a gesture which one may, may have heard or seen a hundred times before. There's nothing that needs explanation. And it's possible for every human being who is really earnest and determined to find out for himself or herself the truth about oneself in this whole world. And then not to get stuck on the glimpse one has had. It's immediately going to sleep again, living in the world of memory. Basui recognized in Koho a great Roshi, but declined to stay in his temple. Really consistent there taking a solitary hut in the nearby hills and for the next month coming daily to see Koho. One day, Koho, sensing the ripeness of Basui's mind, asked him, Tell me, what is Joshua's mo? Basui started to reply, Mountains and rivers, grass and trees are equally mo. Koho stopped him with, Don't use your mind. All at once, his biographers relates, Basui felt as though he had lost his life root. Like a barrel whose bottom had been smashed open. I won't go into reading all what accompanied this. <clears throat> One is so influenceable. Just says, in the intense combustion of this overwhelming experience, Basui's previously held conceptions and beliefs we are told, were utterly annihilated. Because what is important to, to guard and take good care and be aware and attentive and wakeful, that no new concepts will arise. Can they always be seen as they arise and vanish? This is the important thing, not an explosive experience one has had at one time. But to live attentively, wakefully. Alert to all these dangers that our old habits from thousands and hundreds of thousands of years ago. They're still there. Can this be wiped out in attention and awareness? Seen and wiped out before it starts to entangle the mind. Can one question who or who experiencing inhalation, exhalation, count inhalation, exhalation in the midst of all of one's habits? 
and the conditions of this body not used to sitting long hours in a certain position and not get entangled in it. The pain, the discomfort being the one, the two, the breath, the move, not knowing. We will now recite the four vows. <clears throat> 